345. Welcome to the March 2021 edition of the Minnesota Woodworkers Guild monthly meetings. I was just talking to a fellow earlier today and uh, was reflecting on the fact that we've been able to have these as we've progressed through the pandemic. And I think they've been uh, a really good success. I, I'm judging that by the attendance and the uh, email correspondence I get after the meetings. Uh, we seem to be doing things right. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Ed Noy. I'm president of the Woodworkers Guild. Uh, I'm supported by a, a good group of, uh, of folks. That's the board of directors. Uh, we don't have too many of them with us here tonight so far. As I see Roger Christofferson has logged in. I haven't caught anybody else. Um, <clears throat> but uh, you'll, you'll see us at uh, meetings live when we can do that again. Uh, I hope that there are some folks out there who are joining us for the very first time. I see a lot of names coming up here on the attendance list that I don't recognize. Uh, I can, admit, I can admit I'm not very good on uh, retaining names, but uh, there's just a lot of names here that I've not seen before. So if you are here for the first time, uh, welcome. Uh, we're a friendly bunch and uh, we've got lots of uh, free information if you're willing to listen. Uh, as everyone uh, enters, they're automatically put on mute. Uh, with this many people uh, on one meeting, we're already up, already up to 87 folks. Uh, we, we keep the uh, audio on mute so we don't have mass confusion. Uh, if you do have something you want to uh, uh, add to the meeting, uh, use the chat feature here on Zoom and put in a request. We, I will uh, be watching this as the meeting goes on and we'll try to capture this, uh, your questions uh, for anybody else. Uh, we keep getting people coming in, that's great, that's great. Uh, also, one thing we like to do is give our, our members an opportunity to uh, share something that they might be working on in their shop or on their bench. Uh, if you have something you'd like a minute or two to talk to the group about, uh, please send us a chat and we'll uh, put you on here uh, before the actual presentation starts here tonight. Um, <clears throat> oh, if you've been following the uh, our website, you'll realize that uh, one of our sponsors, Woodcraft of Minnesota, is our sponsor of the month. And they have a special deal going on, a sponsor of the month. Uh, <clears throat> normally, they'll give all the guild members, if you present them your guild card. Sí, pero no quiero que yo me oigan. Es para que yo no me oigan. No, pero no te van a oír porque tienes el audífono puesto. No, eh. Don't know what that was, but we got it muted. Uh, let's see, I was talking about Woodcraft. Uh, they, they give all of our members a 10% discount on almost everything except major power tools. This month, they've got a special deal going for members who are visiting the Woodcraft store for their first time. And that's uh, according to their, their own store records. Uh, they're, gonna, they're giving away a, a, a mechanical pencil. I'm not familiar with the brand they're giving away, but uh, it's something free to, uh, to use in your workshop. I know I use my mechanical pencil in the shop all the time. Uh, we will be having another sponsor of the month next month. So just uh, keep your eyes on the uh, website. I, I sent out a message on behalf of the board of directors here a few days ago, letting everybody know where we are and where we're headed here in 2021. Uh, one of the things is we're, we're planning to have our tool swap and expo once again. We're feeling fairly confident that by September, uh, we can do that event safely. But of course, uh, we're always aware of uh, new developments and uh, we'll be uh, monitoring that closely and we'll let you know if there are any changes. That is currently uh, scheduled for Saturday, September 18th to be held at the National Guard Armory in Bloomington, Minnesota. Another one of our events that uh, we're all really hoping that we can have this year is our annual Northern Woods exhibition. Of course, we had to postpone it 
uh, in April of last year when the pandemic first started up. And as things moved along, that postponement uh, turned into a cancellation. But uh, this year uh, we took a look and now typically we hold that event in April. Uh, we all felt that April was still too early to be able to hold that event safely uh, and protect our members and, our, and the visiting public. But we were able to, we felt confident that by the fall we should be able to do that. So we uh, set up a date. Uh, the dates are August, uh, pardon me, October 7th through the 10th, uh, 2021, once again at the Eden Prairie Center. Friends. Okay, we'll have to get some, everybody muted here. That's why we put everybody on mute to uh, keep us from getting interrupted like that. <laughs> Uh, so I see uh, some some notes here. Uh, people are uh, sending in it. It's their first time. Uh, that's really great. I see uh, several, uh, probably a half a dozen or more. That is really great. I'm glad you've uh, able to, to come in. If you have an opportunity, uh, drop me an email. You can find my email address right there on our web page and let me know uh, what got you involved with the Minnesota Woodworkers Guild. We'd be happy to know. Uh, let's see, talked about Northern Woods, uh, fall seminar. Uh, we will be having the fall seminar, uh, another event that we feel safe having that'll be in November. We have not nailed down all the final arrangements. We do have a presenter uh, who has committed. Uh, we're working on getting a commitment for the facility. Uh, we are trying to hold it once again at the uh, uh, St. Paul College and uh, we feel confident we'll be able to do that, but uh, we haven't got that confirmed just yet. So just keep an eye on the website and we'll uh, let you know how that's going. I have a couple announcements I wanna make. At, at our very last in-person meeting, which was February, 2020, uh, we all met at the uh, makerspace up in uh, White Bear. And uh, we had a special visitor there from the uh, Tronics team, uh, a group of individuals who volunteer to work with uh, students in the, uh, uh, primarily in the Minneapolis area. And uh, they like to help them build a lamp kit. The lamp is partly an art project, partly an electronics project, and partly a woodworking project. And they came to us for some help. Uh, what they needed was, um, 800 pairs of sticks made to make some lamps. And uh, we put out a, a plea to our membership and right there and then at that meeting, I had eight members step forward and volunteer to help out. Uh, they worked on the parts. The pandemic has uh, severely delayed the uh, conclusion of the program for us. But today I was able to deliver 800 pairs of sticks to the Tronic team. Uh, we did that in person. And I'd like to thank the, uh, the members who helped us out with that. <clears throat> they are Donovan Cummings. Thanks, Donovan. Uh, Tim Farrell, big help. Thank you there, Tim. Uh, Jay Heumann, uh, Tom Lendway from the Makerspace out in uh, White Bear. Thank you. Steve Marshall, Stu McKenna, and Bill Tiedemann. They all worked great. They all made very excellent, high quality parts. Uh, and uh, I, was, I was pleased to be able to turn those over to the Tronics team today. Thank you much. Uh, thank you again. Uh, also, I'd like to just make a, what's turned into a monthly plea, but we really do need help on our board of directors. I have a very dedicated and hardworking group of folk, but we've got a lot of ideas that we've been collecting during this pandemic. And I'd like to make sure I have some extra people available to help us uh, uh, make those come to fruition. Uh, the most pressing one at the moment is I need a leader for our program committee. We've uh, had a few people join the program committee during this uh, last year, uh, but uh, none of them are in a position right now to uh, take on the leadership. It's something I've been doing myself. Uh, I've got enough uh, things to do being the president of the group. I really would appreciate some help from somebody who could uh, 
pull together a, a, an able-bodied group of people once a month or once every other month and come up with uh, ideas for programs and then uh, administer getting those programs uh, pulled together and delivered. So please contact me if uh, you'd like to help out in that uh, capacity. Of course, something we do every month is um, when we're in person, we like to, uh, Richard Tendick really is, is really good at this. Richard likes to go to Woodcraft and uh, Rockler and uh, come home with uh, a bag full of goodies that we hand out uh, uh, via a random drawing to uh, people who uh, participate in our live meetings. Since it's kind of hard to shove a, a, a flush cutoff saw through the internet, what we've been doing here since March is uh, delivering $25 gift cards for either Rockler or Woodcraft. It, it varies from month to month. And unfortunately, recipients don't have a choice. They get what they get. But here last month, here's the recipients from the uh, February meeting. Uh, David Restucia, Gary Huntsinger, Craig Gents, Rick Nelson, Tom Roska, Stephen Smith, Kevin Damon, Paul Krennic, and Steve Rasmussen. They all received uh, 25 gift, $25 gift cards uh, by mail. Now, let's see, I've been uh, busy talking here and I've been uh, busy letting people in. We have 116 people who have already joined this meeting. I think a lot of people are interested in what some of our members uh, might have to say about their uh, the spaces that they work in. Uh, we had a dry run of this uh, last week and I'm absolutely certain you'll all be impressed because you're gonna see a really wide variety of approaches to uh, woodworking and shops. Uh, let's see, uh, I see a lot of first meetings. Wow, a lot of first meetings. Uh, Bruce Schwartzbar has a wood species identification question for the group. Uh, Bruce, why don't you go ahead and unmute yourself and ask that question. Okay, can everybody hear me okay? We hear you. Yeah. Uh, a while back, I did a bathroom remodel and part of that, I got a, uh, a vanity. I had no idea where the vanity was gonna be made. I bought it from a big box store, but it showed up on a pallet and the pallet said made in Vietnam. And the wood of that pallet, I turned into a a table for my brother-in-law. Can you guys see that okay? This yes. is kind of a, it's got a marine grade varnish on it and stuff. And I've been trying to figure out what this wood is. It was, it's pretty soft and I'm pretty sure it's a um, mahogany sapwood, but I just wondered what the group thought. It's very difficult to tell the species over the internet, especially with a high gloss finish on it. My, yeah, I can tell that. My guess, uh, because it probably came from Asia, it's either Luan, which is a mahogany species, or something really exotic like banana wood. Oh, okay. It was, it, at first I thought it was some sort of cedar, but when you cut it with the saw, it's it didn't smell like cedar at all. It actually smelled bad when you yeah. cut it with the saw. <laughs> A lot anyway. of the exotics do smell bad. <laughs> okay, that's probably what it is then. Anyway, I thought you guys would find that interesting. Very good. Well, if anybody who uh, who's watching has an idea, they should contact Bruce, Bruce and uh, see if they can help him out. Uh, we got another question here from uh, uh, William Frederick. He wants to know if there's a glue that works over polyurethane. Uh, Bill, I'm sorry to tell you, probably no. There are some uh, epoxies that uh, might stick to it. But uh, polyurethane is, I mean, it's a very tough finish, which is really nice, but uh, there's not a lot that, that works on it. Um, of course, one thing you can do is if you're gonna glue to it is just scrape the polyurethane off and then you can use any kind of wood glue. Uh, let's see. Okay, Naomi, I'm gonna contact you. I see you wanna volunteer. I've got you on the log here. Uh, by the way, uh, this meeting is being recorded. Uh, we record all of our monthly meetings and we post them out on our YouTube channel. Uh, they're unedited, so all these comments and stuff uh, show up. 
Uh, let's see. Okay, I, I didn't detect anything else that uh, someone wanted to contribute. Uh, <clears throat> if I missed you, uh, try again, and I'll keep watching this while uh, presenters are talking and I'm not talking. Uh, right before I turn this over to the program committee, I'll remind you that our next monthly meeting is coming up on uh, April 20th. That's a Tuesday. And it's going to be a really special meeting. Uh, we're going to have a virtual tour of the Gamble House in Pasadena, California. Go to our website, take a look at uh, the information we've posted there on it and the links we've provided to the house. That's the house out in Pasadena that was uh, designed and built by the Green Brothers and is just chock full of their famous green and green architecture and furniture. So we'll be getting that tour. Now, I think it's time to get on to the, to the real event. Uh, here it is, it's uh, just at 7.01. We have 121 people on this meeting. That's a new record for us. Thank you, folks. And uh, I'm gonna turn this meeting over to Lonnie Bryan. Lonnie is a long-term member of the Guild. He worked tirelessly on the uh, Northern Woods Committee for a number of years, took a break. He's, he's come back recently uh, as a member of the program committee and Lonnie has set up uh, this meeting for tonight. So Lonnie, go ahead and take it over. Ed did a nice job summarizing tonight's meeting. We have five different uh, shops. Okay, Kelly Brights, Tony Kubalak, Charlie Kasorek, Jerry Butel, and Roger Knudsen are gonna show us how they've organized their shops and what they do in their shops and what specifically they have found helps them do their work. Uh, and the first one we're gonna speak to tonight is, is Kelly Bright. Kelly, are you here? Yep, I'm on. Go ahead. You want me to go ahead and start, Lonnie? Yes, sir. Okay, so I started woodworking in 2007. So after 20 years out of high school before I started and um, I never had the space before so I had a few hand tools before that so this is a evolution over 14 years and I mostly make cabinetry and furniture um, kind of utilitarian designs mostly as a hobby and so what I'm going to show you is just a little bit about what's worked what I've learned over the years uh, the space is a three-car garage uh, it's was unheated when I bought the house so I added tons of electrical uh, you'll see ceiling lights up there. There's 20 of those fixtures. So it's like an aircraft carrier in here at night and uh, 10 foot ceilings, which uh, make life pretty easy. So I'm, I'm amazed what the basement shop guys do. And I don't have any of the challenges of getting a full sheet of stock into my shop. All right. So for, um, we talked a little bit last week in the dry run. Some of the things people wanted to see was storage. So I keep my sheet goods here on a, on a drywall cart. You can see the wheels down there. Makes it really easy to roll out in the driveway and unload it off the truck. Keep uh, some rough stock up there. I generally try and leave it at the lumber dealer. When Youngblood was around, that was much easier to do. Now I have to drive a little farther to get my lumber. So I tend to buy it a project at a time. So there's two projects sitting up there. Offcuts are over there. Uh, I used to make a lot of stuff with cherry. So you'll see a lot of cherry. Um, in terms of tools, when I'm processing, um, have a, and by the way, these are all upgraded tools over the years. So I didn't start out with these nice luxury tools. So 20 inch planer, 16 inch jointer. You'll see a lot of hammers in the shops tonight. I, we were joking about. I have a saw stop table saw. This was the first tool I bought of any significance after seeing somebody cut their finger off. I decided I was gonna go for safety right off the bat. Have a, a drill press that I honestly don't use that much. Uh, one of those tools that takes up probably more space than it's worth. And then I have a, an upgraded bandsaw. And again, something I don't use as much as I thought I would when I upgraded to it. Uh, homemade router cart has a woodpecker top, adjust some router underneath and a homemade uh, cart underneath. And then my bench area, 
all homemade stuff, obviously, old Bosch, chop saw. Uh, what has worked well for me is organization. You'll, if you look on this wall, you'll see a long row of clamps uh, and a three inch strip of plywood that runs all the way across and there's pegboard hooks going, or pegboard all the way down. That's where I hang all my jigs and tools. One of the best things I ever did was get stuff off the floor, stop moving it so I could work with my tools. And then I probably took organization to an extreme. So I'll show you some of the drawers. I use um, the, the foam inserts. Kaizen foam is what a lot of people know it as. This is a different brand. Uh, if you go that route, one of the things I learned is don't do a, a strip for your whole drawer, divide it up. That way you can reconfigure it without replacing your whole drawer. Um, and then I got tired of driving to the store for fastener. So went a little overboard would have every fastener imaginable and I have back stock for a lot of this. So um, things that have worked well for the space when I built this out, um, I have outlets on the walls, every other stud. So I have 12 outlets along a 20 foot wall. Uh, it worked really great on this wall. On the front wall, I didn't do that, wish I had. So I had to go back and retrofit that. And then I do a ton of ceiling drops. So you can see these here. Um, I started with this set and went over in the other bay. So if I move my large tools, I can just reach up, plug them in. Works so well, I came back and added three more a few years ago. And it makes it really nice. So wherever I cluster tools, I have 220 and 110 in abundance. So i stop there. Ed, do you have any questions that you're getting from members you wanna ask? Yes, Kelly, uh, someone wants to know about your dust collection and someone else wants to know how you built your uh, lumber storage racks. So let's start with the lumber since I'm aware. These are just the, the stock ones that you see at Woodcraft or um, Rockler. I have two different brands. I started with PorterMate. I don't think they actually make them anymore. I think they're under the Bora name. So that side of the room, they're one set of spacing. The other side of the room, they're different. One thing I did is I have a ton of pipe clamps up here and I just put a nice eye bolt in the front of those and I have 12, 10 and eight foot pipe clamps up there. Uh, dust collection. So over here, I had a two horsepower Laguna for years and I re recently sold it to a neighbor and traded up to this three horsepower, but it hasn't worked yet because we've got a logic board problem. So I had an electrician actually here yesterday trying to figure out what part's bad. So, but I have this, the two horse version of this. Uh, it's hard plumb, so you can see I've got uh, drops that drop down to all my major tools. Runs back there, I have it on the floor, all my major tools. And then there's uh, plumbing that goes behind or underneath the workbench down there in the far end. You can see the green that goes around at the table saw. And it comes up there, so. This is my normal level of cleanliness in the shop with dust collecting working. Um, I just don't have much free dust in the air. Any other questions, Ed? Yeah, you mentioned that uh, uh, you would have done some tools differently over the years. And uh, yep. one of our members would like to know a little bit more about that. So with the projects I do, I don't use a drill press enough to justify the floor space it takes up. So I'd probably get rid of it. Um, I bought the saw stop with the big 52 inch wing on it. And it's a great place to accumulate junk. So I would buy a 36 inch wing. I very seldom go to the, all the way to the far right, uh, but it's a great place to store all my tool covers that I put over everything to keep the rust off. And I don't do much resawing. So my band saw, it's, it's great and it's wonderful. It doesn't bog down, but I don't use it enough to justify the space. Um, I should have bought a, this large jointer years ago. I started with an eight inch, or all six inch actually, bench top, then went into an eight inch floor standing and then traded up to this about three years ago. And this is a dream. So you no longer have to take a beautiful 10 inch wide board and rip it in half to use it. Um, but it is a pretty penny, but it is a beautiful tool. Um, some of it, <laughs> sorry, Ed. It is indeed, yes. Uh, so some people will, there is shops that you'll see tonight that have the combo machine. 
where you have to lift the jointer top up to get to the planer. I have a bad back and I actually was at Rogers and lifted it and that weight was gonna be way too much for me at back. So I kept my old 20 inch planer and just bought the jointer only version, but you'll see combo models in some of the other shops tonight. So that's one of the things I've learned. Kelly, how do you heat your shop? Um, I have a natural gas furnace up, up there in the ceiling. So I put that in when I put all the electrical and insulation in in 2007. Naively thought I wouldn't need air conditioning even though I'd lived here for 30 years. So about five years ago, I had to put that mini split system in because I just was ruining too many finishes in the summer with the humidity. Yeah, so. the question came in, where do you do your finishing? Uh, I generally in this third bay here, I put down drop cloths and I'll hang up sheeting over the lumber up there and spray in here. And I've done many projects without issues. So uh, it's nice that my wife is tolerant, but she does like to park in here most nights. But if I'm doing finishing, she understands. And I get the chore of cleaning off her car if it snows when I'm finishing. <laughs> so, but small price to pay. Um, if I had to do this over again, I, you know, if I ever got to build another dream shop, I would do something other than concrete floor. It's very hard on my back because I already have five damaged discs. So one of the things I do is I have two layers of cushion mats down here, the ones you get at Costco or Sam's Club. They make a world of difference and I wear um, firm work boots when I'm out here doing any kind of project to save my back. So that's the big thing. And I would have a dedicated space that wasn't a garage because when the car comes in with all that humidity, it can really screw up your projects, especially question if it's been about, raining or snowing. There's a question about spraying finishes. Do you spray? And if you do, what do you spray? I have a, a, a Fuji Q4 HVLP. Sits right there in the drawer. Keep all my finishing supplies in there. So this uh, cabinet system here was designed specifically for that because this is the second generation. Um, my goal was I got tired of moving tools and things out of the way to use my tools. So I built a lot of drawers to fit specific things like in my router cart here. I got tired of having to move that. So I built the drawer for that and everything else fit around it. But, uh, and the other thing that I learned is I didn't just use the full height of my walls, but you'll see my cabinets go all the way up to 10 feet. Um, so some of that I have to get out the big ladder to get to, but it really gets the stuff up and out of the way that you don't use every day. And I'm notorious for selling stuff I'm not using because I don't really have any more room in my shop. So if something big comes in, something else has to go out. Uh, you, you you mentioned the the drops from the ceiling, the power drops from the ceiling, and that you yep. liked them, so you added more. Yep. Uh, somebody wants to know if you find them to be a nuisance. Absolutely not. Um, so I have these are they'll come down to about three feet off the ground. I just use Velcro to hold them up. Uh, they're a, about six foot three right now, so I can walk right under them. I don't hit them. You'll notice the two twenties tied up a little higher because I don't use it as much. Um, I put in two new 220s right here in this machine cluster. So that's where I tend to use them. Uh, the ones I use the most are right over here in my third bay. I'll take this 220. And if I'm running 10 or 12 foot boards through my jointer, I'll swing it over here with the dust collection and run from outside to inside. And it makes it really nice just to put the tool wherever I want for the project. So. But uh, yeah, the best thing I ever figured out how to do was use the wall space effectively. So, all right. What, Any what other questions? Work, what oh, do you sorry. have for a workbench? Uh, I do most of it here on this assembly table with, I don't have a hand tool bench that most people would think of. So I tend to do a lot of my assembly on this. Um, I built the top, it's just three Rockler T-Track tops. I have a, a drawer full of, T-track accessories down here and make up any kind of jig I want. And then I have other jigs hanging on the wall over there that I slide in that give me work holding pieces if I need it. If my wife's car didn't have to come in here, I'd have a hand tool bench over in that space. But, uh, you know, you make sacrifices based on the type of work you do. Sure. 
So uh, one of our uh, members would like to know uh, what you used, uh, what material you used to build the drawer fronts to all your storage cabinets. This is all cherry offcuts from other projects. So uh, talking about uh, naively acquiring wood, I bought 5,000 board feet of cherry. I think it was in 2010 because it was a, a guy that was moving, had an entire barn he had to unload. Well, I filled up this entire third bay. And so I built a lot of projects out of cherry and all the scraps ended up being drawer fronts. So yeah, there, there are friends that come over and like, you have cherry drawer fronts in your shop. I don't even have something that nice in their house. So <laughs> I get lots of crap for it, but it's all off cuts and you'll see lots of sap wood. I was just picking something that wasn't uh, durable and free because I already owned it. And it's just uh, boiled linseed oil. So if it gets really screwed up, I just sand it down wipe it down with linseed oil and it's ready to go. Uh, the other thing I did is for those of you that drink the, the green Kool-Aid from Festool, she end up with way too many cases. These are all double depth. So I can get all my cases out of the way without taking up floor space. So, all right. Um, any more questions? Thanks, Kelly. Should we move on? Yeah. You did a nice job, Kelly. Let's Thanks, move on with uh, Tony Kubalak. Tony's got a basement uh, shop, and he teaches classes there and builds uh, period furniture. Uh, as you probably, as you may know, he's well known and is throughout the country. In fact, I think he won the Cartouche Award for building. Uh, period furniture. Who who is doing a screen share? Tony, is that you? No, it looks like Roger Knutson's screen. You can bump him off just by sharing. Oh, I have to share mine. That's what I got to do. Okay. You cannot share screen while other participant is sharing. All right. How do I uh, get off of it? I'm sorry. I just click the stop, wrong thing. stop your share. It's a up red to top. Yeah. Just, just a regular stop. Yep. Now I don't have anybody. Well, I st it still says Roger's screen. All right. I don't have any. I just have a few faces, so I've got to click something. No, at the top of your screen, it should say stop share. There we go. I got see it. it now. Okay. Got it. We got Tony. So now I'm supposed right. to share. It'll be your turn, Raj. Hold on there. I'm supposed to share now. If you have something, if you have something to show, that's just not you. Well, I'm going to need to. I'm going to show around the shop, right? Isn't that the share? Yeah. Yeah. No, that you're as, you're as long as you're talking, people can see your your image. So they can see me right now. Yep. Yes. Okay. Well, that, there's a good and bad to that, but that's uh, right. Well, this is just so. Uh, my, I'm Tony Kabalik. Uh, so you now you can see who I am, and now I'm going to flip the camera around so you can see the other stuff. All right. Um, now my shop, I have a I have a basement shop, and um, I'm set up for hand tools. That's um, the main thing that I use. Although I do have some power tools. There's a, a bandsaw, an 18 inch bandsaw. Interestingly enough, a guy actually gave that to me. Um, still not sure why, but I was glad that he did. I, uh, that's uh, the power tool I use the most because uh, most of my work is done by hand, although I rough out um, by, with, with power tools. And here's hey, Tony, a, it would be helpful if you turned your phone sideways. We get a better image. Is that better? Yes, sir. sir. Okay. So... Here's a, here's a set of three chairs. I'm gonna have to back up because I actually do not have a wide angle lens on this. Um, but that, there's two chairs that are finished. And then there's a mate that's uh, in, in some, uh, some less, less than, less than a fully completed state. Um, so that's what I build down here. Um, I actually have also built uh, some case pieces which go floor to ceiling, uh, and it's uh, it's pretty hard 
to, even though I have a nine foot ceiling, it's hard to get the, the top piece up there because uh, of the height. Um, and so in contrast to, to Kelly's shop, I actually have five benches. They're all more or less uh, different copies of the same thing. Uh, the tops are, are just two by four stuck on end, uh, glued together. Uh, that one you're looking at now is probably about 27 inches deep. Most of them are all are 24 to 27 inches deep. And then my first bench is this one in the middle, which has got a homemade top based on a, a solid core door. Uh, every one of them has at least one uh, vice that clamps very nice and tight uh, because uh, I rely on that continually to hold work. Uh, here's a, a way I hold a leg, for example, when I have to carve it. Uh, I have a pipe clamp that holds the leg and then the pipe clamp is um, clamped into a uh, this is a, a blacksmith's vise. And this height is very nice. I do not have to bend over much to work on this. If I had to bend over to get down to my bench top, I, I'm not sure I'd straighten out again. Uh, a joiner planer combo. It's an Inca. I think I bought this one probably in 1988. Still use it. Uh, I am a little constrained on the width. I think it goes to 10 inches, but most of the work I do is that that's, that's not a problem. And for something that is wider, um, I'll, 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 I'll either plane it by hand or take it to somebody who's got a sauce or a, a, what's the big um, time saver. I did upgrade to a saw stop about five years ago. Uh, not because I had to, I haven't lost a finger. Um, but I, I wanted to get a new saw and that seemed to be the best one there was. Um, one of the things that I need for storage are a lot of small drawers uh, that aren't very deep. To hold carving tools, for example. Uh, this particular bench right here, this bank you hear, see there are 40 drawers in there. They're all, uh, all about, let's see, 12 inches deep by about 12 inches wide. And this one bank on the right is 18 to store uh, longer tools like files and rasps. Um, let's see what else. Dust collection people wanna know a little bit about. I don't have much of a dust collection. The old, I've got a little bit on the floor here connected to the bandsaw. And when I use the table saw, occasionally I'll hook it up. I have a, a hose that I can drag over there and connect. But I, I usually, the cuts, the time I spend on a table saw is probably 20 seconds at a time. I mean, maybe once or twice. So a lot of times I won't even connect it and then I just sweep up later. Um, so Tony, do you have a library there in your I do. shop? I do. Just try to move a little bit slower, Tony. Okay. The I have a well, I've got a lot of books on furniture. This is a this is the the group that I probably use most often. And so they're there for uh, for easy reference. Tucked underneath that is a lathe. Um, I don't use a lathe a lot. I do occasionally. And so I have access to it. It's in this little, it's, my shop is like a little L. And this little a clove here is probably about six feet wide and about six feet deep. But my lathe is there, a little bit of a library, and then uh, some clamps, and then a sort of junk. So the chairs that you have out there, Tony, did you draw up plans for them or where did, what's the history of them? This particular plan, um, no, this, this chair I took as a class 20 years ago. 
Uh, there's, I think there's a set of plans for it uh, that the lady that ran the school still sells, I think. Um, I have my own working drawings that I made in the class. Um, but if she doesn't have a set of plans, there is no uh, formal set of plans that I know of. I have all the notes for it, but they don't, I don't have them on like one or two sheets of paper. Someday maybe. Well, the, what I was also interested in is, you know, I'm lucky enough to have attended some of your classes and you went to a museum and examined a, a piece, a card table, a gaming table mm -hmm. and came back and drew it up. Is that correct? That's, that's correct. That, that piece, well, you can see part of it right here. Here's part of the leg. Um, that's in that's in one of my my dual clamp uh, scenarios where so I, it's it's ready to carve in that position. Um, yeah, and in this one I did I did draw plans for because I had no substitute. Whereas yeah. the the chair I took I took a I took a class from a guy who whatever notes there were, he drew them. And then I would redraw to just to help me learn. But for the card table, if I didn't draw it, it, it didn't exist. We have a question about your classes, Tony. Uh, sure. Someone would like to know how do you fit a class of people into your shop? Well, I've got space. I've had, I've, I've had five people in the shop in a class and I could probably put one more. If you wanted to get really cozy, I could put seven in here, but um, because I have vices on, these benches are eight foot long for the most part. Um, and so I've got five of them. So each person can have one bench. Having a class with more than five or six people is probably not great anyway because of all the intense handwork that it doesn't wouldn't lend itself well to uh, 18 people because each student sure. needs individual attention and there's just and besides I couldn't put 18 down here unless everybody was in here like cordwood uh, so I have a bench I say I've got I got one two three four five benches. Uh, all eight foot, six to eight feet long, each with a at least one vice on them, uh, and spaced well enough that I think five people can fit down here fine. The class Lonnie was just talking about, we had three, so there was plenty of room. On, on the topic of vices, uh, someone has noticed that your vices are not mortised into the benches, and they'd like to know how you make use of them that way. The vices are not, well, they're attached with big lag bolts. Um, not more. Well, like the, the, the fixed jaw is not flush with the apron of the bench. I think that's what they're referring to. Well, the, the one, well, some of them are. That one is pretty flush. Let me. So a lot, a lot of vices use the apron as the fixed jaw. And in your case, you've got cast iron vices that are bolted on. My vice was set up that way for many, many years. And if I needed to clamp something the length of the bench, I just put a spacer between the board and the bench apron. Well, I have on this bench right here, I have, I have that set up. I worked this was the bench top that I made by hand out of, or made myself out of um, uh, based on a solid core door. And you can see the bench dogs there and they're in line with, with the, um, I don't even know what you call it on the, on the vice, that uh, little piece that, um, that pops up. And so I can clamp something the whole length here, although I rarely do it. I, I've probably never gone past three feet. Um, just because most of the pieces of wood that I'm working on are, um, are relatively small. 
someone has noticed a lot of chisels laying out on your bench and are interested in knowing what your sharpening solution is. Um, okay. Mostly I will use, uh, I'll use water stones when I have to. Well, I'll use a grinder if, if I drop it on the ground and I have concrete floors. So if you drop it on the ground and it hits uh, edge first, you're going to have to grind it. Uh, so I'll, I'll go to the grinder and then uh, on to water stones by hand. And then finally, I have a wheel here, a leather stropping wheel that, uh, that spins. And so for a quick, a quick honing, I'll, I'll use that. Or I have a, a piece of leather on a board that I can just strop it by hand. Yeah, I think it's important to note that carving tools and bench chisels are sharpened in different manners. Yeah, carving tools are pretty much all freehand because there's not a really decent reference surface. And so you just gotta, you gotta, you get close. Yeah. One thing that I have that's a little unique that uh, not everybody might have, my basement shop, I have a double door going out to the garage. So I don't, I can bring material in and I don't have to go through the house. I saw this feature in my, my brother's house years ago. And when we had this house built, I said, I got to get me one of those. Um, and as I said earlier, I've reconfigured this shop a handful of times that I've been here. One of the last time I did was about three years ago and I put a lot of stuff up on the wall. Um, And so now I don't have to step on it. My, the, my floor space is much cleaner than it used to be. And quite honestly, most of the stuff up there you see may not see the light of day in my lifetime, but I don't have to trip over it. So uh, it's sort of out of sight, out of mind. Um, we had a, a question, another question come up about your carving uh, tools. What is your most frequently used gouge? Uh, there isn't one. It's a series of them. And that's a hard one because it depends on what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Like the piece I'm working on now, it's going to be a lot of small tools. So rarely will I use anything bit wider than a seven millimeter. And I'll use sweeps anywhere from one to nine. Um, so for the stuff I do, the, the ones that are the most useful are, are fives and sevens. Um, but you really need threes and elevens. And I don't have every, I mean, I, I've got the Swiss tools are the ones that I've uh, sort of decided on is the, the ones I'm going to be using. And I don't have all of them. I, I don't have anywhere near all of them, but I don't need all of them. Um, and so a series of threes, five, sevens, and nines will get you a long way. And then you can go down to twos and get some eights and is, is you feel like you want to buy more tools. But it's usually I get one if I need to do something that I haven't done before, but I haven't had to buy a carving. Dude, tool. I forgot about it. Hello, something. Uh, we're, 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 we're okay. Okay, all right. Um, Very good. There aren't, there aren't any other questions that have come in here. Okay. Well, that's, um, that's about uh, all I have to say. Well, uh, thanks, Tony. Okay. One question just did come in. Sure. Somebody wanted to know if you ever carve HDU for prototypes. I, I don't know what that is. I don't know what that is. I guess it's high density urethane. Do you, do you carve prototypes? Maybe we should just it, talk about that. It is high um, density urethane foam. I, I carve practice pieces, but I just use a piece of wood. Um, 
So no, I don't use a, I mean, some people will maybe carve something in clay, for example. I don't, I don't do that. Uh, if, if I'm unsure of what I'm doing, I will practice. If I'm pretty sure I know what I'm going to be doing, I'll go live on the piece and go slowly. Well, I go slowly on a good day, um, but we'll take it extra slow just to make sure that uh, I minimize the chance of making a mistake. Although I very rarely miss an opportunity to make a mistake. There you go, an honest man. <laughs> well, thanks, Tony. Charlie, are you hearing about? Charlie Kosorek? Yes. You're yeah. up. All right, well, uh, hi everybody. Uh, this is my shop, it's in the basement. Um, I was lucky that uh, like Tony, I built my house and so this area, this space was intended to be a workshop uh, to begin with. So I uh, have plumbing in here, I have a sink and I, uh, I ran electric under the floor to approximately where I thought I was gonna have my table saw and that's worked out well. And then also uh, adequate uh, receptacles and power uh, around the outside of the shop. Um, so I'm going to walk you around the, the shop, um, give you a, a tour similar to what you've been seeing. Um, I do have my adjustable height bench. I think I'll run that up and down quickly so people can see that. And then I'm going to do a, a brief uh, a description demo with this um, handheld CNC that I have. Um, so anyway, I'll flip the camera around. I can see how to do that. There we go. And uh, so there's the uh, door that's coming in and I have clamps on the wall there. And uh, I have a, a rack with some bins in it. I store oh, various things, scrapers, glue, um, sanding blocks, that sort of things, things that I typically use a, quite a bit. Um, and then this wall over here, I've got a pegboard and I have my, um, some of the planes and uh, files, rasps up there and uh, uh, saws and a lot of hand tools as in like uh, mechanical wrenches and screwdrivers, that kind of thing. Uh, the sink is in the corner there by the, uh, uh, switch box and um, it's like a regular uh, kitchen countertop there. And I, I store stuff in those uh, drawers. Um, I'm backing up and coming around. Uh, you can see there's my bench in the uh, middle there. And the bench isn't very big. I don't have, this, this my space is about 20 foot by 20 foot, which, it's relative. It sounds like a lot, but it isn't a lot. Um, and I, I need to have the space to move around within the shop. So my bench is about five feet long and I like it. It's wider. How often do I use the sink and the fuse box at the same time? Oh, every day. <laughs> um, but um, the bench is uh, 30 inches wide and uh, about five feet long. So, and then the uh, Shaper origin is on top of it there. So going this way around the shop, um, I've got my vacuum cleaner. I, I try, I uh, make a pretty big effort to try to keep the dust down in the shop. I always hook my sanders and routers if I can up to the uh, vacuum. Um, <clears throat> one thing people might be interested in is on the vacuum, I got one of these Bluetooth switches and so I have this, or whatever it is, uh, it's a remote switch you can get on Amazon for like 15 bucks and start and stop the uh, vacuum from the end of the hose, except I got it turned the other way. So I can push the button. I wonder what's going on here. Anyway, it works, it's cool. <laughs> Believe me, there it goes. I can start and stop it right from the end of the hose, which is really handy instead of having to walk across and start and stop the uh, vacuum all the time. Um, I had a little stereo with some speakers hanging on the wall. And one of the things I did years ago, 
that has paid off. It took a lot of time, but it's paid off is I went through and I had all of these bags and buckets of nuts and bolts and I, I sorted and organized them. And so I've got bins, I'll go up close and everything is labeled, you know, what kind of uh, washers, nuts, bolts, and uh, that being labeled and organized just say has saved me so much time over the years. Um, so I have a, a nice router table. Uh, what I really like about this is it's uh, Jess M and it's got the, uh, the adjustment on the side with the crank handle. I like that a lot better than the ones that you have to remove all the time. Uh, recently built uh, some storage drawers underneath there. And then speaking of storage drawers, uh, on the side of my table saw, I don't have the wing that came with the saw because I didn't buy it with my saw. <laughs> um, I bought the saw without a fence or the saw stop, but I bought it just the saw. And so recently I built this little storage cabinet here. And I put, did some experimenting with dies, learned a little bit about dies there. Um, and so, I have all my carving tools, gauge garges in, in here. And uh, I can't show you with just one hand, but the other hand's holding the phone. But these uh, can pick these trays up and set them on the bench when I need when I need to. And various other junk that's stored in uh, that little cabinet. Um, and I have a, a nice heavy duty uh, six uh, yeah six inch by and a 12 inch disc belt disc sander i i love that I use it use it all the time um i got a little uh, just a regular just a six inch grinder i've had for forever um little scraps of wood stuck in the corner and i have one of these veritas uh platters uh machines for sharpening and uh, that works pretty well. Although recently I finally just came to the conclusion that that's not good for flattening the backs. And I actually, I flattened the backs of my uh, chisels and uh, plain irons with uh, stones. And I use that for uh, just buff buffing them up and sharpening the bevel side. Uh, coming around, uh, I have a vacuum pump on this little cart here for doing veneer work and some vacuum clamping. Um, uh, like, uh, similar to what you've seen to in, um, Kelly's shop. I, I do have the combo machines, the 16 inch joiner planer, and there's nothing to complain about with that. It's, uh, it's just, uh, it's a real luxury to have that, that, uh, wide joiner. Um, and then something underneath there, I've got a little, um, air compressor. It's one of those very quiet, it's an Atlas. And uh, I just can't say enough good things about it. It is a fantastic little air compressor. It, it, holds, the, it holds the air pressure. It's quiet. It pumps up quickly. Um, it's just great. It's compact. Um, let me see. Um, I like to have little things in the, <laughs> in the shop that are fun. Um, let me see. I think I saw something about the, the head. This has got a helical head on it. I think most of these have got the helical head. Uh, I have a uh, 16 inch uh, Minimax, um, a bandsaw, and it's a beast. That thing is wonderful, uh, just wonderful. Um, and I have the drum sander. I use that uh, mostly uh, when I'm when I'm cutting veneers, and uh, it's you know I couldn't I couldn't do it without that. I don't think. Um, I have the um, rigid um, sander there, the spindle sander. I like that machine. It's it's very popular. It's a it's a great bargain. Um, there's a few things I don't love about it, but I'm keeping it. <laughs> um, and then I do have a lathe. I was lucky enough. One of our members sold that to me many years ago for giving me a good deal on it. I don't use it much. It's nice when I do use it, 
but um, I'm, I'm not that good at it, honestly. So I don't do a lot of lathe work. Um, and I've got my drill press. Uh, it's a kind of a drill press is kind of special in a way. I inherited that from my father. So um, I, I might just uh, never get rid of that. I'm not sure. And dust collector, pretty simple uh, dust collector. And it, it's adequate. It keeps most of the dust down, collects it from the machines. Um, and I have another bin rack here with uh, sandpaper, finishing supplies, uh, routers, um, things like that. Um, hey, Charlie, back around to your table saw. Somebody wants to know how often you use that tenon jig you have hanging on the wall. Hardly ever. I do use it, but for the kind of work that I do, I really don't do uh, much mortise and tenon joinery. Um, I, I mean, I have used it. It's nice. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but I, I really don't use it very often. And in retrospect, I don't know if I would buy it again because you can make jigs the use it on your table saw that would probably work just as well without that. Um, but no, I, I don't use it much. Agreed. Well, let's see uh, that neat workbench of yours. Okay, uh, let me, uh, yeah, I'll move over here. So the bench, like I said, the bench is adjustable height. There's a, scissors, there's a scissors jack in there that adjusts it from oh, down to maybe from about 29, 30 inches up to about 42, 43 inches. And then there's another scissors jack underneath it that um, uh, lifts the whole bench up off the floor onto a mobile base. And I'll show you, I'll show you um, just how I adjust the, uh, the height of it here. Move the camera around again. No, what am I doing? You don't want to see that. <laughs> set, the, set the phone down. See if I can I think this works. Ed, does that look about right where the bench is? Yep. Get your finger okay. out of the way. It'll be great. Okay. Um, so if you guys can see me, so the bench is held in place with these pipe clamps. When I designed it, I put four of them on here. And in reality, I only need one. So I use one, one of these clamps. I loosen up one clamp and I use a drill to operate the uh, scissors jack. And I just start to... get it wherever, whatever height that I want it, lock that clamp down, and then uh, it's solid again. And, and similarly, like I said, with the, uh, the mobile base, I, I use the drill, operate the jack, pick it up move it around and set it back down on the ground. Um, any other questions about, oh, there's something I should show you on the miter saw that people might be interested in. I don't have a- uh, Hey, Charlie, uh, here's a great question. Uh, somebody, somebody wants to know where you got the plan for that bench. Wow. Um, uh, is this guy, I, you know, I-, I yeah, anyway, I'll leave the jokes aside. Um, I designed the bench and I actually sell plans for it on my website. The website is Jack Bench. So if you look up jackbench.com, uh, I sell plans for it on there. And go to, go to your meeting notice for tonight's meeting. There's a link right there in the notice. Oh yeah, there was, that was nice. Thanks Lonnie. You're welcome. Well, you'll get the bill later. Good enough. So what I wanted to show people on the uh, miter saw is, I mean, they typically have horrible dust collection and I have a, a vacuum cleaner dedicated, old garage sale craftsman vacuum cleaner. The hose is taped on the back on the dust board where that little dust bag normally hangs. And I have an auto switch. And every time I turn the miter saw on, the vacuum comes on, but wait, there's more. <laughs> Um, that by itself didn't give me excellent dust collection. So what I did, I don't know how well you can see it, but I put these shields on here that go around the back. So when the saw comes down, I just, you can't get a good, good picture of it here, but, but it's closed, it's completely enclosed with when it's in the down position so that the vacuum is only drawing 
from directly around the blade. And uh, the dust collection is unbelievably good. It just hardly any dust at all comes off of it like that. So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about this uh, shaper origin. This is, um, this is a handheld CNC. And basically what it is, it's a router. It's just a router. Um, I'm holding the camera, of course, with one hand, but it's just a regular router, kind of like a plunge router, except it's much, much more high tech than a regular plunge router. Um, and how it works is there's a camera on the front. You can't actually see the camera, but there's a camera. This is the front. And the camera scans an area out in front of the machine. And uh, you use this tape, I'll go up close, is this little rolls of tape. There's a piece of it here, there's a little roll of this domino tape. And you put that tape in an area out in front of the machine. And then before you uh, do any work, you, the, you scan the machine with the camera and it memorizes, it puts that, um, that picture into memory. And then it uses, it recognizes this particular, uh, you know, domino tape of that pattern. And it uses that as a reference to, so that's how it knows where it is in the world. Um, that's how it gets its accuracy. Um, so what you do is you, uh, it's, it has some built-in, I'll show you, here's the screen, control screen. And so it has a, a create button. So you can do some of the stuff on the fly. You can make a circle and you can tell it um, how big you want the circle, the diameter. Uh, you can make that into uh, an, an ellipse kind of sort of. Um, you can uh, do a rectangle, you can freehand draw on a surface and it has a basic text, which is not fancy, but it's uh, but you can do text directly on the machine without your computer. Uh, most of the work you do with this, you do on your computer and uh, you'll use a, it uses an SVG file, which is a Adobe Illustrator type file and uh, you, create your image, your, your file, you put it on a thumb drive, this, push the thumb drive into the machine, and then, um, and then all of the files are stored. You can see them, you can scroll through and pick whichever one you want to, to cut. Now I've been working on this heart box, so I'll show you, actually it's more of a sculpture. Start out, it was gonna be a box and it's really a sculpture. But to give you an idea, like this piece here, this was part of my prototype, but this is about, about a quarter of an inch thick and about 12 inches um, across. And I didn't cut it. I didn't cut it out of this piece of maple. This is popular, poplar, but you can kind of see, uh, I cut it out of there and, and it just saves a lot of uh, a hassle with uh, otherwise I would have to have templates and uh, offsets to try to get something that thin and uh, it would be a, a big hassle and it just makes that kind of stuff a lot easier. Um, so, so I'll show you, I can, I can do, um, well, let me, let me describe a little better. So what you do is you select your file. So there's the heart and then, um, you can zoom in or out on it. And I don't know if you can see the, see the heart on there. So it, it, it has that heart and then I can scale it. So I have my file, this is whatever, about 12 inches across. Instead, I didn't want it 12 inches. So I can scale it to four inches. Right now I have a four inch heart and you can see it moving around there. The other heart you see there is where I did my sample. I did a test earlier to make sure this was gonna work for, our, <laughs> for the uh, Zoom presentation tonight. 
But um, with the scan, it scans and you can, it, the piece of hardboard that I have taped onto the workstation, it shows in the picture and I can see exactly where that thing would be placed on the, on the wood. And so, and I could, um, so I'll put it like, uh, put it over there. And then I hit the button that says place. And that places it. Um, so that was in the, the design. Then I go to cut. And with cut, come over here. And you can see the path around the, uh, the shape that I have. And I can cut on the line. I can cut inside, outside. I can cut uh, a sixteenth of an inch or a hundredth of an inch within, you know, away from there and then come make a final pass afterwards. Um, you can enter or you enter the, uh, the size of your uh, uh, router bit and how deep you want to cut and, um, and then away you go. So I'm going to mount this, put this thing on a tripod and I'll, I'll do a real quick uh, cut here so people can see how it works. And I think what I left out of my description here is also that what you do is you physically move the router around. You can see, you physically move the router around. You see that circle. And as long as that circle is, the line that you're trying to cut is within that circle, the machine will move the, the router motor and the bit, keep it right on the line. As long as I keep it, when I'm moving it with the, you know, the line is somewhere in that circle and it will make up the difference. Um, so it's not, it doesn't, it's not like a, a gantry CNC. Um, if I had the space, I'd prefer to have a gantry than this for my type of work. Um, if this has advantages over a gantry, you can do joinery, you can do box joints, uh, mortise and tenon, um, uh, and you can do out, you can do out uh, in a hardwood floor. You could inlay in a hardwood floor if you wanted to. But, um, but uh, for my purposes, this flat horizontal work is mostly what I'm uh, concerned with. So anyway, I'll put this on the tripod. So Charlie, is your... Just machine reading the uh, information from the thumb drive or from the tape that's in front of it? Yes. <laughs> the, so um, the tape in front is also a heart? No, no. I, I'm, I'm being a little bit, uh, trying to be a funny guy here. Um, the, it, it sees the tape and, it, and it's reading that tape continuously as a reference. But as far as the, uh, the heart shape, that's on the thumb drive and it's reading that off the thumb drive. Yeah, so the, the tape tells the machine where it is at any point in time. Okay. Correct, yeah. But it okay, doesn't so give I'm, you the form of what you want. No, no, well, like I said, you can do some basic shapes right on the machine without uh, bringing anything on a thumb drive or a computer, but anything that's more um, complex or, or uh, customized, you, you would do it on the computer and then bring it over in a thumb drive. So I'm going to turn this on. It's going to get kind of noisy. The vacuum hose hooks onto it. This has pretty good dust collection, by the way. Um, and I'll, I'll cut this out and I'll show you get an idea how it works.
Okay, so that's it. It's, uh, it's all cut out. I'll back up so you can see what I'm doing here. So this uh, piece of hardboard is uh, stuck onto the, uh, the table, the sacrificial table. And now I can come in here. Pop it off, take this tape off, and uh, that's it. There's my there's my shape. And it's uh, exactly what it was on that file. Hmm. So any uh, any questions about that? Well, thanks, Charlie. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Well, thanks um, for your time and your effort in preparing that. Well, thank you uh, for inviting me, Lonnie. It was fun. Is Jerry around? Butel? I'm here. Okay. You Take got it me? away, Jerry. Okay, thanks. Uh, Jerry Butel, as mentioned, and um, when I... Uh, got a voicemail from Lonnie saying, we're gonna do shop tours as a next uh, meeting. I thought, wow, that's really cool. Uh, that was my first thought. And the reason for that is that I've been a guild member for probably more than 15 years. And about seven years of that, I was pretty active in volunteer activities for the guild. And um, I know that in various positions I was in, but on the board, the program committee would always talk about doing shop tours, and we could never quite get there. It was just too impractical. You know, how many people can, can you have in one shop was a limitation, and um, an, another was just logistics. You know, if you go to one shop and it's a 15-minute tour or 20-minute or even a half hour, that doesn't make a meeting. So I thought, wow, that's really cool. We're gonna finally, you know, maybe there is something to COVID and Zoom meetings. You know? So that was, that was good. Um, the second uh, thought was, why me? Why my shop? You know, the, there's nothing amazing about my shop, but um, I, I think maybe that's, maybe that's a good thing. And I, I'm not um, knocking my shop. It's a, it's a nice space and I like it and I use it a fair amount and all that, but it, as I said, there's no one single amazing thing about it. And um, I'm just fortunate to have a pretty good sized space. And over many years, I've been in this house for 33 years. Um, I've kind of keep modifying and changing it. And I think it's, you know, it's still evolving, of course, but I think it's, uh, it's coming along, it's, it's ever getting closer to what I want it to be. Um, it's got a lot of and things, including, um, you know, I've got, I've got air run, airlines running along. I've got good dust collection. I've got good lighting that's changed a couple of times. Um, I've got a window, it's, it is a basement job. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, there's a water sink, which is nice to have. And maybe I need some right now. <laughs> um, and um, I have music. So I like to have music playing when I'm sharing. So I thought um, maybe it would be helpful. I, I just pulled out a little blueprint and, and uh, showed uh, what the arrangement is. I think the one disadvantage of the Zoom meeting concept is uh, as you move from room to room, it's not as obvious as when you're standing in the rooms. So I'll show you a little picture quick of what the, um, what the uh, shop looks like. Um, here's kind of my layout of the, of the whole floor plan. And we're standing in that room right now that's marked machines. And to the uh, left of it is, is a room with hand tools with the stairway coming down from the kitchen in between. And in the back, I've added a sharpening station and sanding area. And on the back right, there's a wood storage. So I don't know if that's helpful for anybody, but I thought maybe it would be a good thing to know about. So we'll go around this room, my bigger room, which is about 15 by 22, 23. Right. And uh, 
turn yes. your device sideways, we get a we get a funny image. There we go. Oh, how's that? Okay. Um, so I'll start in the big room here, you know, with the machine room, I call it, because it's got my bigger machines. And uh, in the tucked in a corner, I've got a drill press. Um, unlike um, uh, Kelly, I don't know that I'm, I, I do use it. Uh, I wouldn't say a lot, but it's a fairly, you know, not uncommon used machine. And um, maybe that's partially because I also do some metalworking and I do automotive repair and things like that. So I wind up having other excuses to use it. Um, and I left this laying on the, my, my reminder for myself for a little yellow post-it notes, but here's my airline. So I have an air compressor tucked back in another corner of the shop and I piped uh, air lines to a couple of different places around. So I've got this expandable hose and I can reach just about any corner of the shop with that hose. And uh, it turns out to be a pretty handy thing to have. Um, next to it is probably the machine that I use more than any, my sliding compound miter saw. Get a ton of use out of that, both for the Furniture making, I do a lot of furniture making for myself and family and friends and occasionally a paid job. I've done some uh, fixtures and benches and signs for retail stores that I've sold. But this is really handy. It's on a stand, as you can see. And um, so it's portable. The legs fold up. I've taken it to job sites and uh, it's handy. Um, and one thing I really like about it is that... Uh, it's lightweight and easy, and I can pull it out from the location it's in. And you see there's a doorway there. So I can get a lot of range of in-feed and out-seed and, uh, um, for, that, for that saw. I like Charlie's idea. I would say this is my worst dust maker. Um, I like Charlie's idea. I'll have to get a little more detail from him on uh, covering that surround to gather more dust. So then panning over around the room, going to the uh, west wall, I've got my bandsaw. And again, it's kind of interesting listening to the other presenters. Unlike Kelly, who says he doesn't use his bandsaw much, I love this tool. Um, I bought it when I was doing some big resawing work and discovered it not only resawing, but I use it, sometimes I use it for ripping. It's great for long gentle curves. I had a 12 inch bandsaw and I needed something bigger, I thought. And so I bought this, which is 20 and really big. Um, I'm glad I did. I, I get more use out of it than I thought. And in fact, I wound up keeping the uh, 12 inch because I, uh, I like to have a one inch blade in this and uh, you can't cut too sharp curves on that. And I find it handy to have both of them. So I've got that there. Uh, a couple of saw horses here that I use for in-feed and out-feed for various things or just for resting boards on or whatever. Um, I've got a planer here. This is a 15-inch planer. Gets a lot of use, works pretty well. I'm happy with it. That's good. Um, <clears throat> you'll see as I'm going around, I've got some of the tools related to, or the accessories related to the tools on the wall. So here's some bandsaw blades and an extra high uh, fence for doing resaw work. <clears throat> here's my 12 inch bandsaw, which like I say, I decided to keep and I keep a real fine tooth blade on that one. And hidden behind it's one of the signs that I made, I mentioned I made signs for restaurants and retail stores. And this is a restaurant that happened to go out of business and I was able to reclaim the sign. Um, so maybe as, you've, as I've gone around, you've noticed a couple of shelves on the walls. Um, so again, I like to be able to keep accessories near the tools. And um, so I wanted to put up five of these shelves where I can just, you know, put the related accessories on. Yeah, they collect dust. It'd probably be nicer if they were cabinets with doors, but they work, they do the job. And I also, under each one, put a hook and uh, I keep earmuffs and sometimes safety glasses on each of those so that they're always handy. And um, so just another comment on that, besides being very utilitarian, um, they're all, I, I try to be a little bit, you know, 
um, pleasing with the aesthetics of it. So all the shelves are exactly the same size. I painted them white to match this band of color around the top of my shop. You know, it's got the color selection. It's not just a plain board. I bought nice brackets to hold them up. Um, I put them all at exactly the same height off of the floor. So just, you know, when you look around the shop, and I won't do it because it'll make everybody seasick, but uh, um, you, when, you, when you look around, it just looks a little bit better. Um, here's my joiner, eight inch joiner. Would love to have the bigger ones like a couple of the other folks have mentioned here, but it does the job most of what I want to do. And behind it, importantly, is a window. So this is something I added. This basement didn't have this window. And um, it really became an issue dragging all my wood through the kitchen, right? So I um, um, now can bring wood in here either just by sliding one side to the other or those panes both lift out of there. I specifically look for a window that um, didn't have a center mullion. So I can lift both panes out. I can get full four by eight sheets in through if I want to. But one of the things about a base, even, even though I can, I'd almost am more likely to break down sheets out in the garage. I bought a track saw. I break the sheets down out in the garage and that seems to be generally easier, but I've done it both ways. And it's nice to have this and nice not to have to go through the kitchen with all my wood. Um, shelf for lathe tools and a lathe. Here's a tool that I almost never use and could be tempted to get rid of, um, but I have it, it's there. Um, and then some accessories for my table saw, which we're coming up on here. So I've got a couple of uh, taper cutting jigs and, a f and an extra fence for a dado blade and or insert for dado blade, miter gauge usual stuff um, and the tools with that. And then the table saw itself is here. Um, I have to agree with Kelly. Uh, it, it, this saw has a 52 inch extra table and you don't need that. The 36 inch or whatever the next step down would be plenty big enough in my opinion. Um, it does tend to collect stuff. So, you know, and it, <laughs> the, uh, isn't collecting any junk right now, isn't that nice? Um, which I owe uh, Ed and Lonnie thanks. This is the cleanest my shop has been in a heck of a long time. <laughs> Under the bill um, later. Yeah, <laughs> that'd be great. So in addition, I, I built this cabinet for holding saw blades. I opened the drawer ahead of time so, so you could see it, just so I could set up some blades and uh, have that cabinet. It slides underneath underneath the uh, wing of the table saw. Great place, uses up some space that otherwise is kind of dead space. And I put out a couple of, uh, couple of things on the table saw that I thought were worth showing. Love this gripper. If you haven't used a gripper as a hold down, you know, I've tried many, many other grippers, but they, they're very flexible. They've got some accessories. They're uh, very, very effective for, keeping your hands safe and keeping your hands away from the blade. And there's a, a rubber on the bottom that, that grips the wood and doesn't slide easily. It works well. Um, I've got a remote control for my um, dust collection system. I mounted the panel up on the wall. The dust collector is actually on the other side, but I'll come back to that. But anyhow, just while I was here and the, um, Last thing here is a, a little jig for cutting real narrow strips of wood. Sometimes you need to cut narrow strips and that's kind of a dangerous thing to do. So I made this little jig, the thin board in the middle rides in this track of my fence, the wider board rides on top and the little arm see if I can see, catches the board. So you, you put your strip of wood in here, the little finger catches the board, push it along. You can really safely cut con consistent size boards. And uh, so just a handy, handy thing to have. 
Um, moving, continuing moving around. I've got a mortising machine there that I probably wouldn't have bought, but I stumbled on an amazing deal when um, hardware store in St. Paul was going out of business and they were practically giving them away. And don't use it frequently, but I've gotten a fair amount of use out of it. When I have, I loved it and it's great. I've built a couple of projects with a lot of mortise and tenon joints. And this is really handy for cutting them. And then um, getting to the end of this room is uh, one of these dust collector hoses and a reel. And uh, these are kind of spendy. I was reluctant to you know, go out and buy one, but really glad I did. It, uh, it, it's really handy to be able to just pull that hose out instead of move my whole vacuum around. So it's connected to my vacuum cleaner down there. And uh, I've got the tools up here and I can pull it out. And now what I need is that uh, uh, remote on off switch like Charlie showed. It's really important to have, uh, be able to turn it on from the end of that 25 foot hose. So, and as long as we're there, that's kind of the, um, the first of, I've got, I think it's five different ways I try and control dust in the basement. And uh, so that's one of them, having that hose available that I can get to any, I can get it to the other rooms in the shop easily. Um, so that's one. Um, another one is back on above my sliding compound miter saw. I've got a jet dust collector with a remote control. So if I'm doing things that are putting a lot of dust in the air, I just turn that on and it just runs and circulates the air and keeps pulling the dust out. And there's a couple of filters in there that can be changed periodically. So that's a second. The third one is some of the machines, I actually have an individual um, dust collection. As Charlie said, I think the sliding compound miter saw is the worst thing for, for dust, it's the hardest but this does come on with the saw and uh, it collects, it makes it better, <laughs> not perfect. Um, and then I'll go around, try not to go too fast here, but um, the th uh, third or fourth here, I guess is the, um, the big dust collector I've got in the back of the basement here that I, and I plumbed four inch lines around to my various machines through the, through the ceiling and along the walls. And if you go back to the joiner, um, there's a dust collection there and one coming in above the lathe. So I've got those and I've got a couple more over at my sanding stations. So that's the uh, fourth approach. And I guess the last one occurred to me was, uh, I set this sander out here because I've got two tools that, that both, normally they create a lot of dust, but I discovered this Makita belt sander is amazing in, turn, in its ability to collect dust. It just collects a huge percentage of the uh, dust that it generates. And in the other room, I've got a, a Festool uh, orbital sander that equally good. And so, you know, it's kind of eliminating dust at the source and sanders creating that fine dust. They're the really hard stuff. So that's, uh, that's the other part. So with that, I'll leave this room and uh, go back into my wood storage area, which means I'm going past my furnace here. And uh, just the first thing you'll see is the uh, dust collection, the big dust collector that I use. Yeah, and uh, I don't know if we can zoom in on, on the pipes that I use. You know, here's a part where it breaks off three different ways to, to uh, go to the various tools and machines. So then back in this room, the other thing that I have besides uh, electrical box and all that is my wood storage. And um, my basement only has about a, seven and a half at best foot ceiling. And um, there's pipes hanging from it and other things. So I would really, I think I would prefer having vertical wood storage, but went with horizontal because of the height limit. As Kelly and I think others said, 
it's nice not to be on the floor either. So not only am I limited to seven and a half feet or less because of pipes, but if you want to get a foot off the floor, so you can't get much. So I did a lot, as much as I could horizontal, and then set aside a couple of separate sections for short vertical pieces. And uh, it kind of wraps around a corner. I made a little special rack for dowels because they were always kind of a hassle. And then more for kind of sheet goods and others and, uh, you know, related stuff here. So I tried a couple of different things before I reached this. And one was I built a bin. And I had, I think, a four by four sheet of plywood left. And I made it a bottom of a bin and made a box with foot, foot and a half tall sides on it and divided it up. And I thought I'd put all my piece scraps in there. And I did, and it looked great for a while. And then they kept building up and building up. So I built another one and another one. And the lesson I really learned was throw stuff away. <laughs> Just get rid of it. You'll never finish a project without more. Um, you're always going to have more pieces when you're done. You'll never have less. Yeah, that, that beautiful chunk of cherry. Uh, you, you might be able to use it for a drawer runner or something in the future. But guess what? Um, and it's, uh, you, you'll make more, so keep moving on. All right, so that's my uh, wood storage area. And moving on from there, this is again back in the corners of my basement where, you know, there's my water heater and water softener, but I said, hey, there's space back here. It can be used for stuff. So I kind of made a little sanding station. I've got a little mini belt disc sander there. I've got that same rigid sander that Charlie had there. And I've got a drum sander here. And the drum sander has an exhaust port. So I can, in the, and then I made use of this area underneath my stairway to store a couple of machines that I, I like and I use. And when I use them, I usually use them out in the big room. But it's nicer not to have them in the way when I don't when I'm not using them. So this Craig router table, it, it's on rollers, it pushes real easy under the stairway, it gets it out of the way. And this Craig jig, which is a great thing. If you've ever used Craig pocket jig, the little hand one, this is a machine. I bought this when I was building a complete new set of kitchen cabinets a few years back. It's amazing. It, it does that same great thing of drilling the Craig holes without, um, spending so much time setting up and clamping. You just throw the board in there, and pull the lever and it's done. So that's my sanding area. Recently, I took another little area that was kind of, there's pipes here everywhere, but I grabbed an old saw, an old table and sawed it down to fit in between and amongst and made myself a little um, sharpening station with a grinder, a Veritas uh, sharpener, my wet stones are tucked away back there. There's a mat to put them on. And probably my favorite sharpening tool is this light with a magnifier. Um, I, I don't know, I had a lot of trouble getting good results sharpening until I started seeing what I was doing along the way. And with this light and magnifier, I can check things and just help my sharpening skills a bit. So that's that area. And then the final, is the room with my, uh, where I do my hand tool work. We'll go in there. Um, I've got a, the wall over here just has your standard set of chisels and tools and things hanging on the wall. An old stand that used to house my router, my radial arm saw when those were a thing. And, um, you know, nothing special there. It becomes a, De a desktop that <laughs> accumulates stuff. Oh, and it is sort of my office. Speaking of desktop, you know, get all the pens and pencils and whatnot. A wall of clamps over here. Um, here, this section of the wall is, this is sort of decorative, but this is a whole set of old hollow and round, hollows and rounds, chisels, I mean, planes, hand planes. And um, the, I don't use them. I'm not a, I'm not a, uh, uh, not into doing that. 
But um, these were my wife's great grandfathers and mostly from around 1910 or something. So pretty cool stuff. Lots of clamps. Um, over here, just more walls of storage. Well, here, let me step way back. Whole wall of storage. And uh, like uh, well, somebody said, this is all scrap wood from a house I built that, uh, you know, all this cherry wood were, were leftovers. So I made some cabinets, cherry frame and birch panels. And um, I've got just things like um, bins full of various hardware and, you know, all the things you need for woodworking in addition. Uh, I, I normally try and avoid keeping anything, keep, I like to keep everything off the floor, um, but here's a case where I'm breaking that rule just because it, but it's my, you know, drills and jigsaws and, you know, that all those little hand tool, hand power tools, handheld power tools. And my workbench here, well, you can see that. Nothing special, unique, it's just a big, heavy, you know, solidly built that uh, provides some good weight. It's got an end vise on it and um, it does the job. I left these things on top because just to point out, when I'm in my shop, I almost always wear this nail apron. It's really handy. I find it and here's just kind of some of the basic things I always put in and I wind up stuffing more stuff in as I go through the projects, but they, uh, um, you know, it just saves a lot of hassle running back and forth and going from there. There's my music. I like to have some music, still have CDs. <laughs> but, yeah. So um, I think we, that's about it. We have a couple questions that came in, Jerry. One, one uh, person wants to know what is the CFM rating of your uh, dust collector? Ooh. I don't know. It's the Jet Two Horse, I think, if you wanted to look it up, but I don't happen to know that offhand. Um, it's it's pretty good. I wouldn't mind I wouldn't mind bigger, but uh, it does a job. It picks up fairly good chunks. I have to be careful about uh, not having too many uh, gates open at one time. If you notice, I have a gate on each tool, so I can shut off most of them. Another. Uh person noticed you've got quite a few Powermatic tools. They were interested in knowing why you selected Powermatic. Um, I found them to be a good quality, um, seem to seem to be a reliable, good quality tool. And frankly, some of the tools I have, I have because I'm a uh, Craigslist shopper and <laughs> I found some good deals on them, but I don't buy just anything. I won't buy a tool, it's, it's, it's junk, but um, yeah, I just a good quality tool. I found them reliable. Very good. That's all I see in a way of questions here, Lonnie. Thanks, Jerry. So hey, Roger, welcome. thanks for waiting so long, maybe past your bedtime. So maybe you can start your shop tour. Okay, for my shop tour, um, because of technical reasons, I had to uh, put it on a video and with Ed's help, figure out how to transfer the video from an iPad to the Mac to the Google website of the Guild. So Lonnie, I guess you're gonna, there are two. The first one is a few 30 seconds showing the outside. And the Sorry. second. That's showing up for everyone? No. Not yet. The second video after he does this short is about seven and a half minutes of the tour of the shop and uh, one of my projects. Hmm. So here's the technical part, how to get this thing running, eh? Okay, so here's my, okay, so here's my shop. It's a 26 by 34 building that I built about 15 years ago with a uh, top floor that's just basically for storage in the shop downstairs. I had a person door and a garage door, which I rarely use. They ask how I get my lumber in. I just open the door and walk in. That's about the size of it. Now we'll go inside and take a look. Okay, now that we're inside, just take, go do a scan from right to left, looking down the hand bench, down to the bandsaw, 
the other end, stairway to the second floor, table saw in the center, uh, planer jointer around there, and this item we're gonna talk about a little later, and lumber storage, that's it. So, to return, let's go here to the hand bench. And I made this bench uh, from the butcher block slab from Grizzly and then surrounded it with a uh, two inch by six inch or seven inch wide band all the way around and a vise on either end using um, trestle style legs to keep it nice and sturdy. Two trestles, one up and one down, or two up and two down. And then a container with drawers I built to uh, hold tools. The idea of this was maybe when I get old and uh, shuttle off to some apartment building, I can have a complete hand tool shop in the second bedroom or something like that. Uh, here are storage. Sorry about the jerky. Chisels, planes, marking and measuring tools, saws and everything in there. Along with a board that I use for the most used tools. Just a simple board hung on a French cleat with a few hand tools that I use most often. I use hand tools more often than I use power tools, but I have a full embarrassment of riches of tools. But a, none of you have one of those pointy things, I'll bet. That's a Fibonacci gauge. We'll talk about that later, maybe at a whole meeting. Never mind, never mind. Uh, when I built this, I put in floor heat. There's 900 feet of tubing in the floor in the cement slab, and that's the boiler that, that keeps me warm. And it is fantastic heat, uses much less fuel than uh, the one in the house. Going around, we have a router table, also on wheels, mainly so I can pull it out and uh, uh, put the back on it. And next to that, of course, is a one of a pair of my Altec Lansing speakers to really keep music going in here nice. And I have an 18 inch uh, Rikon bandsaw, drill press, Behind that, the floor model uh, mortising machine. I bought that fancy mortising machine because the head, the whole head, head tilts. And I think I've tilted it once in 15 years. Uh, my entire paint system is there. Clean, clear, not a mess, well organized. And this used to be a downdraft sanding table Back in the old days when I would basically try to belt sand everything into submission. Now it just holds paint where I mix things and do that. A little cabinet with uh, little cabinet with screws and nuts in it. Some roll away cabinets under the stair, under the stairwell. A sharpening center in there. And then of course another really handy is the Rikon 10 inch bandsaw because bandsaw blades are such a pain to change. I got rich and bought me a small one as well. That's the 10 inch. And um, that's kind of the do all. It is a fantastic little machine. It works beautifully. All right, then going around, I do have a back door. That's like every rabbit in a hutch has to have an escape, all right? Don't use that very often. The band saw with, I mean the, <laughs> the chop saw, uh, waste bucket or box underneath the saw and a shorts box for plywood and sheet goods on the right and other solid shorts on the left. The nice thing about having built my own shop is got nice windows after having been in a basement for years with the dusty windows Going around, I'm going to come to the middle of the shop, and I have a a nice eight foot outfeed table. It's the old style bench that I made years ago. 
some drawers underneath with uh, drawers underneath with um, clamps and a few other tools, a vise, and a top that can be replaced easily. Nice to have that outfeed table. Um, a lumber storage, I built a rack and the arms are much too long because they hold too many boards and you get they get lost in the back, as you probably can see. And, uh, and then my plywood storage is on a bin I made, just attached some bracing to the ceiling and, and slide them in vertically. All right, now we'll walk to the big project here. And this is a project I called Dolly Plays Stravinsky. Uh, it is uh, an exercise in all stretching, stretching the limits of bendy ply. Um, it is a surrealist piece. I want people to enjoy and have a laugh, a smile, some surrealism. And you can see, of course, Igor is holding up the melted piano. He will get some makeup here from a painter friend in a few uh, days. That's a picture of him below. The music emanating from the piano is uh, copper and it depicts accurately the first two measures of Rite of Spring by Stravinsky. Now Salvador will eventually be holding up that edge, that left edge of the piano keyboard. I'm uh, working on that. It would be a, a figurative statue of uh, Salvador Dali with his face, and it will be in the style of a Giacometti sculpture. And of course you can see the strings are beautifully strung, uh, absolutely to their total, absolute, accurate, harmonic intervals. Right? You believe that? Well, okay. Anyway, that's the shop here. I think we'll take questions live. I had to, I had to record this early because we had some technical problems. And there's the desk where all sorts of wonderful planning helps. And those are a couple of friends of mine that uh, didn't bring enough beer when they came. All right. <laughs> Roger, you have to unmute yourself and then you could uh, go over there. Okay, I'm uh, I'm um, unmuted, so. Someone sorry, the, know how, how big is your shop? I it's 24 by or 26 by 34, built on a cement slab, as you saw, two stories. Uh top top level is for mostly for storage, it ends up uh picking up all sorts of extra stuff. The picture was, uh, quality was horrible and the sound quality was all garbled. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, when we did it, it wasn't, but that's just transferring it around. Um, I don't know if there's any other questions that anybody has. I'm, I'm open to them. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Dolly Stravinsky, Giacometti, Knutson. Did I miss anyone? <laughs> no, I think you got them all. <laughs> I think you'll be seeing that piano in uh, the October Guild uh, show down at the Eden Prairie. Looking forward. I hope so. Lonnie, you got any wrap up? That's it. I think we've gone through everyone and I hope everyone enjoyed seeing a little snapshot of very fine men and their shop. I do. I see a question. What were the tree like shelves by the back door? Uh, those were two legs to a six foot long top a sofa table. It's a commissioned piece and uh, the people wanted that designed so they can store books on those shelves. They're quite the readers. Uh, that project is since the video has now been completed and will be delivered. Uh, I, I guess that's it. Excellent. 
Well, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, at our peak, we had 130 people participating in this meeting. I think that's great. We, we ran about above 120 almost all evening. So uh, I'm, I'm glad that uh, that many people had an opportunity to see these fine five shops. And thank you to, to, to the five of you for presenting that and letting us into your homes, if you would. Uh, <clears throat> next month, uh, Amelia will pick it up with that uh, uh, tour of the uh, uh, Gamble House that we talked about at the opening of the meeting. So with that, I'm going to call a close to uh, the uh, March edition of the uh, Minnesota Woodworkers Guild. Thank you all. Good night and be safe. Woo -hoo! Thank you. Nice job.